to solve problems uh, of the relatively poor. This could mean small farmers, artisans, uh, 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 people living in villages in general, you know, things like that. So uh, the belief that entrepreneurship can solve their problems led me to do that. And we've supported close to around 350, 400 enterprises over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, we also, uh, I mean, a lot of the companies have raised successfully lots of capital. Uh, we have exited from some of those companies. Uh, our work is primarily in India, focused on three major sectors, uh, healthcare, education, and agribusiness. And the reason why we do those three sectors are because we believe that bad health pulls people back to poverty. So if you don't support their health care, they'll, pull, they'll get pulled into poverty. Good education lifts people out of poverty. So uh, if you educate them well, if you skill them well, it gives them. Now, agribusiness gives them the money to spend both on good health as well as education. So that's the simplistic reason why we focus on these three sectors. And all the enterprises that we generally support are uh, in these three sectors. We've recently added energy and clean tech because of the climate change you know, importance and focus also. Uh, we work in India, we work in uh, Africa, we work in uh, Philippines and Southeast Asia. We also work in the United States, but we're building a global network. Training incubators like you, uh, hand-holding incubators to become more successful in their work. And you can visit the Wilgro website for some of that work. We are uh, building a large 100 incubator network with an exclusive focus to incubate socially relevant you know, enterprises. One of the other things that I did was also uh, around 2015, co-found a venture capital fund. Uh, many of you might be familiar with venture capital. Uh, so I created a venture capital fund called Mentera uh, and now serve as a full-time uh, executive partner in that fund. Uh, while I no longer uh, run Wilgro, I stay on its board uh, in Wilgro, but I actually you know, uh, I'm a partner at Mentera. At Mentera, we invest in early stage companies, uh, seed stage, series A stage companies, if you're familiar with those terms, but I'm happy to uh, you know, answer some of those questions as we keep moving. Um, uh, Mentera also invests in agribusinesses, healthcare, education. We've done 10 investments. Uh, it was a small demonstrator fund of 50 crores. Uh, we've completely invested that money. We've had three, four exits, or actually, uh, you know, two uh, clearly, another two planned. Uh, and I think it's been a great journey of learning in managing a venture capital fund by the side of the incubator. My mission is now to make sure that many other incubators also have set up funds by their side. But one of the challenges that prevents that is many of the incubator managers don't understand investing or they don't come from that background. So this, I found this topic very relevant for many incubator managers because many incubator managers are comfortable in space-based incubation. Uh, some are uh, uh, comfortable in knowledge-based incubation where you advise, but world over, incubators are also moving to investment-based incubation. Uh, so space-based, uh, knowledge-based, and then finally investment-based. So if you all have to actually become a sustainable incubator, we believe that investment-based incubation is an important part. We do that in Wilgro. There are many other incubators also who do it. But finally, if you do that in a sustainable manner, we believe that the incubator itself can be sustainable because if you start investing in some of your startups and if they really make money for you, your incubation model itself will be sustainable. There are risks associated, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's a much better model. So what I'm going to talk today is how VCs look for, uh, what VCs look for, uh, and VC means venture capital, uh, what it takes to raise money and manage relationships with those venture capitalists. So that's really the essence of my uh, conversation. But before I go forward, 
um, I wanted a, you know, a, a, yeah, I wanted to ask a question to the participants in this in this um, session. Have you worked with any incubator of yours in raising venture capital funding? That's a question. So maybe if if uh, some of you want to respond, that will be good. Uh, that will give me a sense of how much you understand uh, venture capital funding. Can I get some responses? So you can uh, type in the chat box itself. Not it for us, sir. One of one of the participant replied. Sorry, uh, what did they reply, please? Not yet for us. Achha, okay, okay. So and any more responses? Not worked. Not work means? I think uh, they they haven't uh, been part of this process. Okay. Okay. So so, so on a zero to ten scale. Uh, this is for all the, the the participants. On a zero to ten scale, how much do you understand about venture capital and venture capital based funding, which is going into your startups? On a zero to ten scale, how much do you understand? Is it one? Is it three? Is it nine? Is it you know where where do you stand? Goldie says five point five. Three. Okay. Five. Okay, good. So I think you're somewhere in the middle. You have some understanding, but I think, uh, you know, some people a little bit better than the other, but that's fine. I'm going to make this simple uh, but, uh, so that I don't complicate things for you. Uh, I will share the slide deck. So at some point, you know, uh, that slide deck will serve as a reference for you. And you can, of course, clarify those questions subsequently with, uh, you know, well wishers of yours who understand investing. Uh, my job, my, my goal at the end of the presentation is to set you thinking on what you need to do better to become better incubators while helping your companies raise venture capital funding. Uh, is there anyone in this group? Uh, my first question was on a zero to 10 scale, your rating and all of, many of you have done that. Thanks for that. But in any of the uh, people present here, for any of your incubates, have you been part of that process with that incubatee in helping them raise VC funding? Yes or no? Be good to hear yes or no from the panel, uh, the participants, please. So Karthik says never. Has anybody done it? Anyone here has raised venture, I mean, work with an incubatee of yours to raise venture capital funding. Okay, Anjali says not yet. No, no, okay. Okay, so maybe that's the mood of the, or the, or the, or the, or the, the sorry, the status of the, of the group here. Okay, great. So, uh, so that's a good segue into what I wanted to discuss. So let me just get started then. Okay. So, you know, when you approach an investor with a company, with any of your investee companies, please approach the right investor. And what do I mean by right? The right investor will invest in a company at the right stage. Why do I say at the right stage? Because if you think about it in simple terms, it's like an invest, uh, venture capital investor is like a real estate investor. You buy land, you want to make sure that that land appreciates in value and uh, you are able to sell it at a higher price. It is not to hold that land forever, right? So you got to buy that land at the right time, at the right place, and then you've got to sell it at the right time, right place, which means you've got to sell it when the price is actually going up for a piece of land. Similarly, for a company, if you buy the company at a certain price, at a certain stage, you got to make sure that the company is growing and you should be able to sell it 
therefore at the right time the company is not growing your capital doesn't appreciate and therefore you don't get any benefit from your capital gain capital so who you go to with your incubative matters a lot for example if you went to a a private equity investor say for example bain capital or kleiner perkins if you go to them they are all interested in scaling and growth however if your incubate hasn't even demonstrated at the seed stage prototypes no point pitching to private equity investors you will have to pitch to angels and more patient philanthropic type investors they are the best suited for early stage seed type investments because they have the appetite to take risk because they can invest smaller pots of money but as you move up the company requires much larger chunks of capital the risk appetite generally keeps reducing and therefore the first stage you will see what is called angel investors and that's what you see here the first block the second block is really which is what is called venture capital investors and the third stage is what they call private equity investors so what you need to understand is you need the you need to pitch your incubate depending on the type of the investor and that is super super critical if you pitch to the wrong investor you don't get money so what type of investor depending on the stage of the company is important with that as a background let me go to the the section on what to really vcs look for and and keep thinking about each of your companies uh and that is super super critical vcs look for a differentiated business why do they look for a differentiated business that differentiated business should be able to grow fast compared to the others think about an amazon think about a flipkart you know think about so many such unique businesses which subsequently had a it was really standing out and because it was standing out it had a unique value proposition so as incubators supporting your companies you need to really understand for an effective value proposition you need to really make sure you have, should have a strong need to fulfill while fulfilling that need you have to be a company that fulfills that need in the most unique possible manner what you see in this picture is uh, you know the billet balls and you see the red ball which is so unique from the others if you are one of the blacks out here or the grays nobody cares you need to have your differentiated value proposition and you really need to understand who are your customers if you need to make a differentiated value proposition because your customers will determine whether your value proposition is unique or not so you know the first thing that you need to really ask yourself is is this incubatee's business having a compelling value proposition that is unique does this incubatee understand his or her customers so you should all, use all your incubation money to help your to help your company or your incubatee understand how they are different from each other do experiments with competing products and services defining through market research and test saves testing of these products multiple customer segments that you want to sell to if you did all that you will build a very strong value proposition so the question that you might want to ask yourself as an incubator manager is when a company walks in or when a company is selected for incubation and subsequently when you start thinking about you know advising the company through mentoring are you asking all these questions around their value proposition if not please make sure that you ask them yeah i'll pause here do you have any questions on value proposition otherwise i'll i'll i i'll take your questions before i move to the next slide 
any questions of the group here you got to give me an indicator so yes no that will be useful is no questions uh, one of the participants said no sir okay great so if that is the case yes no yeah okay so if that's the case i'll move to the second part in the earlier slide you saw the growth of a company like a hockey stick steep growth and as i mentioned a good venture capitalist expects certain quick returns which means the business has to grow rapidly growth of the business rapidly is dependent on multiple factors but one big factor is how big is the market if your the company that you're incubating is serving a small market then it will never ever raise venture capital if you are interested in your company's raising venture capital make sure that you select companies as your incubators or some of them at least should serve a big market and therefore you should be able to identify and help them through researchers or consultants or or maybe the entrepreneurs themselves really identify the market segment you need to understand help them understand the size of the market you need to help them understand whether their products and services are unique enough and can they penetrate at a at a time horizon where you can get this steep hockey stick curve you need to understand what are the challenges in penetrating at a faster speed and scale so overall the point that i'm trying to make is if you if you want your incubate to raise capital don't focus on a demo day that is important that is the art of pitching to investors but more importantly you have to select companies who have a big market that they can serve and don't get me wrong just because the size of the market is big doesn't mean that the enterprise is capable of actually getting to that i'll get to some of those things later but one very important criteria when you select your incubator if you want them to raise venture capital is how big is the market okay uh, if you have no questions i'll i'll move to the next one very important question that a venture capitalist will ask you and you need to be able to answer it because you have incubated that company you've been with that company for one or two years closely working with them you need to be able to tell them is this scalable means if they're doing say 5 lakhs business a month can it grow to 1 crore in a month how can it happen what is it dependent on how do you charge the customer is it one time payment is it recurring payment is it uh, what is the basis of the pricing model all of that you've got to become very clear who are the company who what dependencies are there for this company or for its product to be used by the end customer you know all these are very very important aspects uh, for a venture capitalist and if you again as i repeat if this business model is not clear enough if the risks are too high if the revenue model is not clear enough if the dependencies are too much and we can't manage that then the business model is a weak business model and it is very unlikely that a typical venture capitalist would get interested in it unless and until you have a strong plan and a very compelling plan to communicate to them that yes this business model will work and as i mentioned in the early stages of the journey as go back to you know in the early stages of the journey the business model's importance is lesser because you are piloting but as you keep moving up if you don't build clarity on your business model there's no way investors especially venture capitalist investors would be interested so clearly in the middle stage 
as you are establishing unit economics economics of you know demonstrating proof points of your profitability that you should have enough data points to show to your investors i am not profitable today but this data that i am generating today in terms of profits indicates to me that i can become profitable over 6 months or 12 months or you know 18 months or it might take even 24 months but then the market size is so large that please wait for 24 months then we'll become really big right so so the point that i'm trying to make is make sure that you have a really compelling business model without that and if the risks are too much if the revenue model is not clear it is very difficult to convince a venture capital investor to invest in your company usually when i speak to entrepreneurs and this happens it always happens even in our case um entrepreneurs tell us that you know they do a i don't know whether you've seen this and many of you would have seen it they make a table and then say competitor 1 competitor 2 3 4 and then you will write the name of your company and then you will do tick mark on price you are low on uh, uh, customer friendliness you are the highest on um, user friendliness you are highest so you know the point that i'm trying to make is these tick marks really don't matter you've got to have enough data enough data to suggest that you are better than your competition which means in many cases if you are selling a product you might have to buy uh, a, a competitor's products and you might want to do systematic trials with competitor products to actually say your product is unique and different from the others that's what will make your product actually unique you will understand your competition better because otherwise one small strategy of competition forget about their product it could be an after sale service uh, 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 strategy of this that might actually resonate with the customer and therefore as a result they sell more and they kill you as a competitor so it's very important to compare with them study how you are different from them and that's the only way you can be always ahead of your competition usually venture capital investors know that they are investing in a company which needs steep growth which also means that they keep asking is this company likely to be a market leader is this company going to be better than its competitors and if indeed you have to convince them that you are better or you will be better it's very important to understand and study your competitors so you have to encourage as incubation managers to encourage your incubators to understand competition better not in an academic way of actually you know putting a table and then doing tick mark but really supporting that with strong data and customer you know feedback uh, you know very systematic customer feedback surveys uh if you don't do that if we, if you tell them that hey you know it does you you are truly better nobody is going to believe just much as just as much as your end customers are not also going to believe because each customer does their own diligence before they buy a product so think like your end customer with your product analyze multiple products uh, and and one of these recent times when we were as a venture capitalist was going to make an investment in an english uh, language training company my colleague who, who was leading that investment uh, and and that this particular english investment company was uh, was actually doing english speaking for those in the age of 3 to uh, 10 years so really younger kids and they had created a very strong you know story based approach and a very compelling you know uh, mobile based uh, uh, method to teach english better uh, but my colleague was so convinced about the product but he said i am so convinced but i want to make sure that my children are equally convinced so he subscribed to the product for one or two months he got his children to use that platform and it took us two or three months to actually experience the product through uh, our colleagues ch- children and then we got convinced that this product is superior than what they were using earlier 
our investment decision was heavily based on our conviction that this is a superior product much better than competition so you know you as an incubator you might be able to experience you might want to experience a product yourselves and that will help you even feedback to the incubate on areas where it is bad and they can actually then improve and finally therefore your that particular product or that company will be better than their competition and hence will be able to raise capital much more easier and faster yeah so till here any questions otherwise i'll keep moving on let me know if you have any questions on the chat box please i'll pause for a couple of minutes and then you can tell me if you have are we good if one of you could just say yes no okay asim says good okay theek hai so i'll i'll keep moving okay now comes the most important as they say you bet not on the horse but on the jockey in early stage venture capital investing because once you know that there is a market once you know that there is a big market once you know that this product or service is really really different from competition then to make sure that the product really sustains the competition and make sure that the product really captures the big market it is all dependent on the team the team is such a super important aspect of any business and the business and the team are so inter to be linked and we as investors keep asking a whole lot of questions around the team one such question that we keep asking is is the team complete which means are there people who understand finance are there people who understand sales and marketing are there people who understand design engineering manufacturing so that means it's complete right for any for different businesses there's a different set of competencies but is that complete right that's the first piece that we keep thinking about so you as an incubation manager when you see a te team usually where everyone is a product designer that is source of worry because they're not complemented complementary to each other they'll think same way and that's not good for the company so that's where the completeness comes in you need to have diversity of skills and diversity of actually even attitudes to make a complete team uh in in many teams we like somebody who is an introvert somebody who is an extrovert somebody who is an aggressive guy somebody who is humble because when they come together that's how it makes a complete team and the reason why this completeness is important is when companies go through multiple phases in their life uh in some cases they go through bad patches sometimes it's actually success the if you have a complete team different people in the team especially the founding team will be able to handle different situations and that is why completeness becomes important you need also need a competent team it's not enough to have studied marketing it is super critical to be able to really aggressively sell or be a smart designer or be really smart in your financial numbers and excel sheets and anal analysis of financial ratios and all of that so essentially competency is 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 very very critical experience is important but it is more important in execution oriented businesses less in technology businesses so if you see the zomatos of the world the swiggies the flipkarts was created not by experienced people young dynamic people but complete teams competent teams in their areas but they were not experienced but if you see execution oriented companies where it is largely services oriented brick and mortar companies you will see lot of experience uh, uh, helping them and that experience is super critical to make a successful company especially a barefoot feet on the street like a hindustan unilever or you know companies like that 
where there's a lot of stock, a lot of sales, a lot of distribution, logistics, a lot of uh, 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 direct selling uh, to the customers or, or, or to distributors, dealers. That is where experience becomes super critical. And finally, we look for integrity and humility. Humility because that allows learning to happen, allows reflection to happen. And entrepreneurs need always to be learning. And if they're not humble, they will not learn. But this is also, you will see, you know, what I'm saying, you might mistake it. Some people might appear aggressive and arrogant in the way they communicate. Maybe they're humble at heart. But finally, some level of humility is important also integrity. We look for integrity a lot. Are they, can they walk the talk? Are they consistent in what they are saying? Are they, uh, 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 are they prone to corruption? Corruption of any kind? You know, so, so are they truthful? All of that as part of integrity. So we are giving our money as a venture capitalist to an entrepreneur or a founding team we want to make sure that they have high levels of integrity. They will learn along the way with humility. That's the only way pivots will happen. Changes on the business model will happen. Evolution of the company will happen. Otherwise, many times we have seen, you know, even with the founding teams fighting between themselves, you know, fighting with investors, you know, it has to be seen dispassionately with high levels of humility, which allows this tension to be sorted out and uh, the company, you know, moving forward without any challenge. Uh, make sure that as incubator managers, when you're selecting companies, you select for such people. You also have a job as an incubation manager. Once you know that the team is not complete, you've got to make sure that you help them find other co-founders. As an incubator, I think that's an important job you can't actually pitch them to investors and say, okay, now find a co-founder. You got to get a co-founder. They need to work together. And that's something that we look for. We want to make sure that before we invest, these co-founders have worked together sufficiently well. They've gone through ups and lows because we want to make sure that they'll stay together after we've invested. So the incubation incubator and the incubation manager has a lot of role to play in building the team before they even approach an investor. And some of the things that I mentioned are the things that you should do to build a solid team uh, to make your company venture capital investable. Sir, uh, we have one question sir, in the chat box. Sure. Um, can I just go there? Mm -hmm. Can I read out it, sir? Yeah, I, I can read it. I'm just reading it now. You were mentioning about the scalability concern. Uh, when that startup company assures scalability, question arises about the window period they require, considering the product they into how to approach this or other. Yeah. So, you know, there are some, some thumb rules. Uh, I think Dr. Manoj has asked this. See, Dr. Manoj, basically, usually, if I invest my money in the bank, I get a certain interest rate. If I invest in mutual funds, I get a certain interest rate. If I, as an investor, invest in a venture capital fund, I expect a certain set of returns. That returns usually uh, what a venture capitalist expects from a company, usually, because this is all based on economics, econ the, the, state, the, the, the situation and financial situation in the country and things like that. Usually, people expect a 25% IRR in any investment. We, you can say that that is acceptable, not acceptable, but that's reality because your bank FD will earn you six and a half, seven percent on an annual basis, right? So on, a, on an annualized basis, when you take a higher risk, when you're investing in the shares of a company, don't even have any collateral, unlike a bank, a bank will charge you, say, 12 to 15% interest. A venture capitalist will finally charge you 25%. Now, you have to work backwards. So your window 
of scale, you need to work backwards. Can I offer 25% return to a venture capitalist? And in what time can I offer? That is where I mentioned the earlier scale question comes into play. So if your company grows from 1 to 1.2 crores, to 1.4 crores, then to 1.75, then to 2, and this 1 to 2 happens in 5 years, it is definitely not a fast-growing company. Because think about how you're growing. If you raised a venture capital and then said, I can offer 25% return for a company just growing year on year at less than 20%, you'll never be able to offer that. So the question really to think about is, if 25% IRR work backwards, you might be lucky. You might get venture capital investors who might not expect that much. That's OK. But the point that I'm trying to make is that might be a good you know, time frame to work backwards in figuring out the window period, how fast you should scale uh, to help you achieve that. Now, you might actually choose to say, no, 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 you can't scale at that space. That's fine. Or you might choose to say, I, I will not attract venture capital now. I will go back to my angel investors. I'll ask them to give me some more money. And maybe in a year's time, I would have built all the data and the comfort to say, I can achieve 25%. So I think, I don't know whether I've answered Dr. Manoj's question, but it is really a function of working backwards from what a venture cap cap capitalist is seeking, usually of 25%. I think Asim had a, another question. So maybe Asim, can you ask that? I'll wait for Asim's question. Yeah. See, this is a tough one to bring in co-founders. And that's why if you see a lot of companies, uh, so, I mean, I was reading somewhere about how Israel churns off more entrepreneurs. And one of the reasons that they've attributed it to is a one year, uh, the compulsory, uh, the military service that Israeli citizens, all citizens have to go through at the age of 21 or 25, I don't remember exactly. Now that has allowed them to be put in a very distressful, distressful you know, situations in the battleground, working with people that they never knew, but having to work as a team. They say that one year of immersion in a military environment is creating more entrepreneurs in Israel, in a small country like Israel, right? So while in India, if you think about it, a lot of the startups, the co-founders seem to be classmates or you know, college mates, hostel mates, ex-colleagues. We like working with people who we know. Nothing wrong with it. So that's how co-founding teams are actually built. But in many cases, if you work with a person, you understand his weaknesses and strengths in a professional setting, as opposed to students and classmates and friends, you understand in a personal setting, but you really don't understand them in a professional setting. So I don't have a full answer to your question, but one thing is very clear. As a co-founder, if you need to bring on another co-founder, you've got to think about completeness of the team. You've got to ask how that other persons uh, uh, analyze and assess the competencies of that person. Just because he's a classmate, just because he's your brother-in-law, you shouldn't bring them in. So that, if you don't do it at that stage, you land up with a co-founding team or a founding team that is not complete and competent. So first point, make sure that you identify people who you work with. If you worked in environments where that person is not there, then that much more difficult for you. You could, uh, you know, hire a headhunter to get you a person but not as a team member, but as a co-founder and have a very, I would say a one year dating period with that co-founder to help each other 
understand each other, but on a part-time basis or whatever that is, uh, or keep meeting each other, discussing, debating, you know, uh, 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 getting to understand each other's perspective. And that is more of a selection process. Those are a couple of ways I think you might be able to build a co-founding team. But this is a such a, a, a big area of knowledge which has been documented. So, you know, uh, groups like the Kaufman Foundation, you know, I'm sure KSU and themselves have actually studied this and, and research is available. But essentially, as a founder, go look for people, either yourselves, go look at your experience and you, you, wherever you worked for people or get a headhunter to, uh, to hire people. Those, I think, are, are ways that you can actually bring on new co-founders. But please make sure hard conversations in selecting them happens. And that's the way I think you can address this question. I hope I've answered that. Okay, great. So um, let me move on from that. This is pretty self-explanatory. You got to really know why you need money. The reason why I say this and why I put it up here is because if you invest in the wrong thing, for example, if you really don't need facilities and if you invested in facilities, that money is not going to help you prove what you need. So what you need should always be, and I call this a relay race. And maybe I should just go back to, just go back to the first one, yeah? Think about this, an angel investor comes in when they know that from the first point they can get to this, you know, the, the, this point at least here. The venture capitalist starts from this point but knows that they can get out somewhere here when the growth is happening. Private equity comes in here, knows that they can get out somewhere here when the, the peaking is happening. So people are coming in and going out. So it's like a relay race. You're running, you're handing it over, and somebody else is coming in, right? You as an entrepreneur needs to really understand what it takes to grow from here to here at the first level, here to here at the next level, here to here and so on and so forth, right? So at the different stages, you need to know where to move, which means in the first stage from here to here, from the organization founder to seed investment, you might not need any manufacturing facility. But if you wrongly invested in a manufacturing facility, you really don't prove certain level of economics for a venture capitalist to be convinced. So that is why it's really important to know what you want to use the money for. You've got to use the money to move from one stage to the next stage. And you need to have adequate money for that. You have to be capitalized well. Think about this. COVID hit suddenly. And if, as an entrepreneur, I was in the early stage and I had to move to mid-stage. If I didn't have say $100,000, say one crore to, to do test marketing, to hire the right people, I couldn't have moved to mid-stage. If I don't move to mid-stage, the next round investor who's watching me says, hey, you know, they haven't moved well, so I can't put money. So you need to have adequate capital. You need to invest at, in the right expenses. And this will vary from company to company. It will be very difficult to say what is right. It will very be specifically dependent on each company. But one thing is clear. In the first stage, you got to demonstrate that you have lots of information. In the second stage, you have to demonstrate that with a pilot. And that is where it's called the unit economic stage. You got to show that one unit is working. So if you are building a chain of retail stores, you got to have your first store set up. Then you got to show, show, show that you can build a chain of stores, say 30, 40. Then come scale that you can actually set up multiple types of stores, retail stores in multiple geographies. These are all different things that you want to prove. Depending on what you want to prove, 
is how you de determine what kind of money to be used for what. So, so the point that I'm making is, this is important when you as incubators guide your incubatees on using your own incubation money. If you don't use your incubation money to, prove, to demonstrate enough proof points that will allow a venture capital investor to come in, then you've not done your job as an incubator. The company has not done its job of actually de de defining well where they need the money. And the money then literally, it might not get wasted, wasted or literally wasted, but the money is not useful to move the company from one stage to the other to really make sure that an investor feels comfortable of coming in at that stage. One suggestion and advice that I keep giving to uh, entrepreneurs is make sure that you are in conversations with an investor always. So that you can get indication of what they think are the proof points for them to come in. I know of entrepreneurs who systematically do that with two, three investors at the same time. They share an update with them. Uh, they, the on, investors like it because they see it as pipeline building. The entrepreneur gains from it because investors give feedback on what they think about the stages. That will allow this company, the entrepreneur, to decide exactly what they need to invest in. Is it selling in a new geography? Is it going deeper in the same geography? Is it adding two, three more products? Or is it making the existing product more profitable? Different VCs see it differently. So engaging into conversations with two, three VCs, keeping in touch with them, that is a super important thing that will allow you to decide where to actually you know, put this money. Because then you can do that conveyor belt, you can run the relay race, hand it off to the next person, and the next person, and then the next person. Um, you know, you, uh, I don't know how comfortable you are all with Excel sheets and financial models, but it's important that the entrepreneurs need to have a financial model. The financial model will have assumptions. And that's why I, I mentioned earlier data is, some level of data is important. Uh, we will also be able to run sensitivities on that financial model if that financial model is built well, saying, okay, I wanted to get to from A to B, but what if I got to C? How much capital will I need now? You know, things like that. So it will also give clarity to the incoming investor of your assumptions and how you are thinking about it. And a financial model, maybe you're not a, 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 a Excel expert or a chartered accountant, or a CFA, that's okay. That's where complementarity comes in. But there are enough people who understand it. You got to make sure that you have them as a part-timer or you know full-timer, but they should be competent in creating a model based on revenues and costs, being able to tell you, you know, how much capital you need, you know, what happens if that capital is not raised, and you know, what costs can you cut and things like that. We as investors. When any entrepreneur comes to us, we're pessimistic about their assumptions because entrepreneurs are very optimistic people. So we pull them down with our pessimism. And so when, if you as entrepreneurs present a business model to me or a financial model to me, I usually, if you tell me you will do one crore in three years, I will say you will do 50 lakhs in six years. Because I know that for a variety of reasons, you will not hit your number of one crore in three years. So I kind of reduce those estimates and I, du I double the time or triple the time that it'll take for you to reach there. Do you know why? The reason why I do that is because if I don't get the hockey stick number, I don't get my returns. So if I take longer to get to that returns, my IRR goes down. So it is better for me to be conservative about it while taking the risk on the numbers that you are telling me. So you as an incubator, job, your job is to prepare the company to create a realistic financial model. 
the incubator manager can be an expert in building the financial model or you should have a service provider who can be employed on a case to case basis with each company working along with them for a couple of months together where it comes out of your incubation funding whether it is gcm's funding or utter innovation mission or dst dpt you know when they are funding 50 lakhs keep aside some money for this and that will help create a robust financial model uh as investors we dislike working with entrepreneurs who don't have an understanding of their own you know financial numbers not that you should be a super expert in 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 valuation or you know uh, on the financial ratios but you should be able to understand why the numbers are the way they are all the details about financial ratios you know uh, all of that uh, expert will be able to sit by your side and explain to others but you need to understand the the basis or the assumptions behind the costs of each of these and and my point to you as incubator managers is to make sure that you add this value to companies earlier on if you are preparing incubators for an investor please make sure that the, you really prepare them on this aspect because otherwise usually investors need to do this job after they go in and that's not a great thing to do because my expectation as an investor is i assume that the incubator has prepared them or incubated the financial model yeah uh i won't talk about this but i will share this with you this is a sheet or a, what is called a rubric that you can use to define which stage you are in you know my first slide was depending on the stage you need to go to certain types of investors so your funding sources and how the investor perceives risk will depend on your stage to define which stage is your company you can use this you know somebody asked me this you know how to build a complementary team so if you go back here um, you will see that you know in the management team usually in some cases in the early days it's the inventor alone or an innovator of a product then slowly a business development person comes in and then maybe one or two senior leadership team members but then that's over time but as that happens you have lesser risk that is playing but the risk is higher in the first stages and slowly playing out but what it does is these are some of the milestones that you can work towards as i mentioned no a to b to c or to d you can say that a in 6 months i want to get from pre seed to early seed to do that these are the indicators that i need to get to and that will need only 10 lakhs but from early seed to maybe late seed i will do it in say for 18 months but i will need 50 lakhs for it and now you can actually evaluate to move from uh, a patent being written to a patent being issued what kind of money what kind of activities are required to do that so that will determine how much capital you need and that will help you determine which stage you will be after taking that money and after say 12 to 18 months this will give you a good sense of planning movement from one stage to the other stage i'll pause there take a few questions before i move on any questions If there are no questions and we are good please alert me on what basis do we calculate the equity percent offer to investor based on current valuation or projections so valuation is the present value of the company but the present value the net present value of a company is always computed based on future projections i say a company of mine is worth 1 crore not based on the assets of the company today but based on assets and liabilities 
that you that you projected for five years, but you bring it down to your present value of today, and that's what what is called net present value. So you 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 discount the future value to today's value, and that's how you arrive at your valuation today. Some people use uh, you know simpler things like uh, uh, a multiple of revenue, say one times, two times, three times, depending on the company. For tech companies, they say. if you are doing 1 crore you know you can ask for a valuation of say 30 times of that so 1 crore of today revenue you can ask for a valuation of 30 crores so when an investor comes in if they have to invest you know 30 crores they are buying you out 100% if they are investing 15 crores they are taking 15 uh, 50% of your company they are investing you know accordingly if it is a 30 crore valuation so some people use uh dip, dip, depending on each industry you use a multiple of the revenue you compute net present value based on future revenues you uh, there are people who compute value based on profitability so different methods and yardsticks people apply that really depends on the industry uh the financial services industry for example we are considering one company now which is a a banking correspondent company which is not take that company uh, offers loans of other banks it is not it doesn't have capital of its own it's identifying borrowers selling the loan product of a say a federal bank or a catholic serian bank such a company usually some people uh, 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 evaluate and provide the valuation based on the revenue that the company has achieved some people do it based on the repayment level so so it, it varies from investor to investor but by and large in an industry in a financial services industry versus agri inputs versus uh, you know tech companies healthcare hospitals there are different you know each of these industries have their own approaches so your the, to answer your question it will depend on what industry you are which investor you are talking to and usually the earlier stage investors i mentioned no the angel investors are more generous and liberal while as you move up uh, they are a little bit more you know data driven uh, uh, while it is more of an art in the first stages it becomes more formula science driven in the later stages because now you have more data in the first stages you don't have that much data so that's how you arrive at that and as i mentioned the equity percentage offer is roughly this 25% some people might expect less than that but that is the ballpark that we i've seen people expect and and just for your understanding why they expect 25 is also important to understand when an investor venture capitalist investor is investing in a portfolio of companies some fail some succeed the 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 simple thumb rule says out of a portfolio of 10 2 or 3 is the one that will scale or one maybe exponentially scale 2 3 <laughs> are fairly successful 5 6 fail so if you have to cover the losses of the 5 6 you got to make sure that that one really gets so when you start off you start thinking that everyone in that 10 should be the winner winner which will offer that cover the costs of all the losses so that's how they start off and uh, over the journey of a 10 year fund life uh, investors life cycle of a venture capital fund when losses happen they'll have to write it off and when they write it off the return expectations actually keep coming down so overall they look at 25% they take their fees out lot of losses in the capital finally it will come down to net this is the gross that i was talking about 25% finally a net return will be in the range of say 15 16% which is far more than a 8% in a bank or say a 12% that a mutual fund might give you or maybe 15% in mutual fund. so you know that's how this you know percentages work out okay great mm. oh can you hear me 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. I think there's a question from Fasil. Is that correct? How a VC sees a company started by a husband and wife with complementary skills? The scenario maybe they worked long years in IT services like TCS. I wanted to understand. Ah, good question. You know the the thing with uh, the thing with a husband wife combination. It's worked in many cases. There are also cases where it's not worked. in the cases where they have not worked is cases where the husband and wife on their personal life have also gone through problems and separated and then it becomes a real battle and that you know affects the company also so think about the husband and wife as professionals if you thought about them as professionals and have complementary skills perfect think about the husband and wife as actually building a a company that is not too many other stakeholders not too many other shareholders maybe one or two investors who they really know each side knows each other well no problem also but when you start mainstreaming having to get teams and team members that you don't know the size of the company becomes better bigger starting to get more investors who you don't know then lot of questions doubts issues start happening unless the husband wife combination they might be complementary but they need to ensure completeness in their team absolute transparent decision making which is not governed by the husband wife relationships making sure that they really separate you know the personal uh, uh, life versus what they're talking so i know of people who have decided that they will not talk company matters when they come back home so you know this 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 maturity in the people to rise to the occasion and behave extremely professionally is not very easy so that leads to problems some vcs see that as a disadvantage uh some people definitely see it as an advantage especially those who are thinking about strategic acquisitions uh not if you're you know growing the company by yourselves with financial investors and things like that if you know that hey an exit will happen to a strategic investor who will buy out everyone uh maybe they will retain both husband and the wife maybe they husband wife duo will say only one person will remain but if i know that i don't need to run the journey long i my risk levels come down i'm okay with that but i think i i, I don't think there's a black and white answer to this depending on the situation it will play out in our own portfolio in two out of the 10 companies we have a husband wife uh, combination in one of the companies the husband was outside we encouraged them to get him inside and that was not that was for actually complementary skills but when we did that we did make sure that the management system the the decision making systems are all very transparent and clear because we didn't want a situation where uh, uh, you know both behave like ceos clearly functional separation is is crucial uh, decision making is transparent approval process are transparent and known to others because otherwise when other leadership team members come in they'll become doubtful of how decisions are taken it's not just a vc problem uh leadership team members who will come into the company at times also are uncomfortable in a husband wife company because they think that everything you know it won't be as professional as it should be but again in many cases when that husband wife the couple knows professionals who they have worked with then it's a lesser problem so so that's the point that i was making if you attract such a husband wife couple attract uh, stakeholders be it leadership team members be it investors that they have experienced before both sides know each other less of a problem but otherwise sometimes it could become a a challenge i hope i've answered that question uh, paul sir we have couple of questions in q and a session okay So 
So what could be an ideal safe equity debt ratio for an incubator to, you know, at this stage, I wouldn't worry about equity debt ratio uh, at an incubator. You're talking about equity debt at the incubator or at the incubator? I think at the incubator. Now, at this stage, there's no financials, right? Uh, it depends. I mean, if you go back to the stage uh, 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 journey, you are demonstrating as an incubator, if you're picking companies who are already established, that means you're really not an incubator. If you're truly picking early stage companies, there's no financials. They wouldn't even had one, uh, one year of audit of their accounts. They're very early stage. So I wouldn't be extremely worried about a situation for an incubator of debt equity ratio at that early stage. But as you move up, clearly a company I mean, our bankers today don't offer loans unless they have a three-year operating history. There are what is called venture debt firms in the company who offer debt like a venture capitalist, but they have the right to convert their debt to equity. So that is very different. The point that I'm trying to make is it takes three years to really get a usual bank debt. Otherwise, what we do is you pledge your mortgage, your property, take a personal loan from a bank, and then that personal loan is advanced to the company as a promoter loan. That's fine. But then keep in mind that it is, you, you pledge your you know, promoter assets. But the point is, the moment those assets come, say a one crore loan is infused based on your house, which has been pledged, and you've got a one crore loan. Ideally, the bank starts now looking at equity in the company. So if you don't have an equal one crore equity, the bank gets worried because they don't see leverage. So ideally for every rupee, if you can get two, three rupees of debt, that's great in the early stages because equity is costly. You know, you, your company would become so valuable two years, three years later, you don't want to sell your stake too earlier on. Your debt you can service at say 12%, equity is at 25%. So, you know, see the cost of equity Equity comes at 25%. If you can service debt at 12%, that's much better for you, right? So you got to have strike that balance in uh, equity debt is what I would think. Uh, I think there's a Vishal question. Uh, valuation is an alien to arrive and understand for a different set of people. What is the easy fund? I, I described this, you know, depending on the industry business, you can do a top line valuation. See, the other thing that you can always do is you can get into an arrangement with the investor if they're okay with it. Saying today, you and the investor don't know what is the correct value because you don't have data. You can always say, if I hit these goals, then at that point, I get a certain valuation, which means it's subject to performance and milestones. That makes it transparent for both sides, easy to negotiate. The problem is entrepreneurs believe that their business is a billion dollar business. Investors think it is a, a million dollar business. So how do you arrive at a common ground? And the best way to do that is agree on a valuation subject to performance. But a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to do it because it's easier to fix a valuation and move forward. But I would say, if you think you can achieve a certain performance, why just promise that and then link your valuation to that. You can always have a base valuation and then you can say, okay, my valuation that I expect is 25 crores, but I want it to be 40 crores if I hit certain you know, revenues, profitability and things like that. That's good for you as a company because you'll try to work towards those, those metrics. Otherwise you would have you know, sold the company at such a high price that the next person will struggle to be able to offer that price. So think about again, a piece of land. If you bought a land at a very high price, one year down, two years down, when you sell it, the guy coming in will come and say, hey, I don't think this is really this costly. He'll have other options of land to buy. Similarly is investment in a startup. Investors as other startups to invest in. So, so make sure that you have the right you know, balance in terms of valuation. How do VC see startups with more than two or three co-founders? I mentioned this. I, we always like two, three co-founders as long as they complement each other. Uh, 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 
are complete and have high levels of integrity. We'll be extremely worried if there's a co-founding team where one person's integrity is questionable. Uh, and integrity and, you know, integrity is something that is non-negotiable across, you know, the founding leadership team. Uh, so uh, that's the answer to that question. Any other question that I'm missing? Yeah, in the VC evaluation sheet, will social impact be there? Yeah, so social impact in our case, that's a good question. Uh, we have a very, very detailed way by which we analyze uh, social impact. Social impact is the entry criteria. So if they don't meet a social impact basic criteria, for example, if their product or service is not impacting people who are of a certain economic level, we've defined it for a, you know, just a, uh, uh, for our own understanding, we said the product or service does not, uh, cannot serve people whose incomes, household incomes range from 1.5 lakhs to 8 lakhs. Then we believe that it can't create social impact because that's the kind of households that we want to serve. We like if their product or service can impact say 1.5 to 2 to 3 lakhs, but you know, it's not always possible. So that's the range that we've kept. And uh, when a company comes in, the first question we ask is, who's your customer segment? What is the income of that customer household? So it becomes easy for us to assess whether they indeed serve that or have a plan to serve that particular segment. So yes, answer is in our evaluation, impact is a what we call a gating criteria. If it, if it doesn't cross the gate of impact, we don't even do all the other evaluate, all the other evaluation you know, around business viability, team, and things like that. And, and, and I think there's a, a part of that question is, does, does the founding team, should they have an interest in impact, a, a commitment to impact? Yes. Unless the founding team has a commitment to impact, impact will never stay in the company. So what we also do is to make sure that impact now becomes a part of the charter documents of the company, the MOA, the Articles of Association. In our agreement with the company when we invest, we have a, a shareholding agreement which has one addendum, uh, sorry, annexure, which talks out the impact charter, which talks out the impact goals, which actually mentions how impact metrics will be measured. It talks in, in some cases of a board subcommittee, which will evaluate the impact performance of the company and so on and so forth. So, much like financial metrics and financial returns, we worry about impact returns. And that's Mentera because we have a so there are more social impact or impact investment fund. Uh, this might not be true for other usual venture capitals. Okay, so if that is over, can I just keep moving on? Oh, I don't know what's happening. A second. Okay, so, you know, so before going to the venture capitalists, make sure that all these things are done. Yeah, I don't think you should get into a lot of complexities here, but one suggestion I have for KSUN and uh, incubator managers is if you're not comfortable with investing in general, you might want to run a primer course in venture capital investing. It's extremely useful, much better than debt based investing because debt is really taking no risk we're all working with startups who should be you should be taking risks so a primer course for all the incubator managers say maybe you know 12 sessions 15 sessions uh, over the next one year or three, maybe even a crash course for three months will be useful because uh, on, on when i asked this question at the start of the session 
many of you said you were three, five, and all that. Ideally, if you're an incubator manager or work with an incubator, this should be in the range of, I would say, seven to eight. Many team members working with us, the next job of theirs we are seeing is into a venture capital fund. And because you've now worked with uh, as an incubator, worked, some people have worked with startups, that experience is what a venture capitalist really likes. And uh, therefore, uh, having some sense of, you know, investing uh, uh, terminology, understanding of investment terms are all useful uh, for you to incubate uh, these companies and prepare them before they go to venture uh, funds. But these are the things that are very important to prepare um, before you take a company. For example, if you're saying that a patent has been applied for, you need to make sure that you have the documentation for that. Uh, if you are saying that the patent is under review, you need to have documentation to that effect. So make sure that all the information is put together and they, this is called what is called a data room. You got to ensure that your financial model is there. You need to ensure that if you have employment contracts, all that is put. If you have co-founder agreements between founders, you got to make sure that that is actually documented. You know? So whatever is possible, you got to make sure that all your returns that have been filed, if you're a three-year-old company, if you've done audits, audit reports, if you have uh, returns filed that, if you have licenses, GST and all that, put all that together. So, you know, make sure that you have all the information, the MOA, AOA, you know, director changes filed. All that is important because a VC will take you through what they call legal diligence. And these are documentation that they will need to look for. And if they don't find it, they will be a little bit uncomfortable. There's nothing wrong, some documentation might be not available. They'll say, okay, I will invest, but in three months, I wanna make sure that these documentation is all complete. So they will also link, say if it's a one crore investment, they'll maybe give 25 lakhs to D. Before they give the remaining 25 to 50 to 75, they'll make sure that they'll put conditions to fulfill all this documentation. So that's uh, very, very important. Um, you know, so there are many venture capitals in this country. You need to choose yours. That's what I, the first question, what stage, what sectoral investments? There are funds that do only AI based investments. There are funds who only do edu tech, right? You know, there are uh, 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 funds who focus on agribusiness. So, you know, depending on your particular, you know, company, the incubate company, you got to match that with VCs. Doing a plain demo day, I don't think is always useful. Uh, what, what you could do is match every company to the right VC and maybe even take them to their location, to the VC's location, as opposed to waiting for the VC to come to you for a particular demo day. Uh, because companies become mature at different points in time and you can't wait for a demo day to actually pitch. Also, getting the right person in a demo day is important. So the senior people who decide whether a company needs to be invested in at the VC firm, they don't attend. If you get junior people, you know, it's going to take a while to get to that decision. So it might be just better you as an incubator manager network with the right partners at the venture capital funds. And then once you have that right network, you can actually send in them an email saying, hey, Here's so and so a company. So looks an interesting company. They've achieved so much. They need X amount of money. Can you do a meeting with them? Now that introduction from you as an incubator, not just for one company, multiple companies over the next three, four years, will build a relationship with the VC. And uh, uh, the entrepreneurs who would have never met the VC, but that becomes a great value that you can offer to the incubating company also. So. Shortlist VCs, build that VC database, build relationship with VCs. Uh, at each incubator, make sure that VCs come and speak to your entrepreneurs. That all multiple ways to build the relationship. And uh, that is very important to make sure that the best VCs support your incubators. Uh, I think there's lo lots of matter here. I don't want to 
just go through a, a lot of this but let me see if there's something you know this is the diligence piece that i mentioned you know they do diligence of the idea market team legal and financial so all the documents that i mentioned you need to all keep it all together uh, yeah i just want to highlight one thing in this slide when you make a pitch uh and what i wanted to highlight is show is always better than tell some people actually make a fancy deck which is also important should be but you know i want to talk about the story of one of the companies that we invested in uh which does anemia testing after four or five years of investing the company called biosense uh, it's a medical device company that does non invasive anemia you know uh, glucometer urine analyzer and a couple of other de devices and uh, they was acquired by a billion, a billion dollar uh, us company called perkin elma but what i remember in the first meeting that i had we were all you know uh, hearing the pitch of this entrepreneur abhishek showed us this device which was a non invasive way by which you can actually test for anemia by clicking a picture of the eye and by with that picture of the conjunctiva by the color of the conjunctiva you can actually tell the hp level in blood but what he did was interesting he never came and showed us that particular device he had it in his hand what he first did was he came and asked can i test for uh, uh, hp in your blood there were seven people sitting in that room it was a demo day uh, all of them said no don't prick me some said you know i have a fever going on some said no 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 i on a uh, some uh, food regime everyone had some reason to say don't prick uh, for my blood one lady you said i am i'm pregnant so don't you know different reasons people said then he suddenly brought this other device out and said okay if you don't want to be pricked for blood here's this device i will never prick for blood but i can take a picture and tell you that you are anemic or not and he did that he took pictures of all of us in the room fortunately none of us were anemic but he told us how our hp level was the point that i'm trying to make is showing is always better than telling if you can help the other side understand the inconveniences or the pains of the existing method versus and you show it with your new method that's far more impressive usually what i've seen is people always try to talk about their own product but you've got to make people experience like the earlier case i said my friend's children they wanted to study english and he went through it he saw the children you know being delighted with those classrooms for us to make an investment decision so showing experiencing is always better than tell is better than tell and that is something that you might, as incubator managers you might want to train your incubators to actually encourage them to to do so um so that's on on the pitch itself um uh, you know so this is the vc process not much of you know the, there's a first meeting there's a second meeting that's after that is when the partners meet partners are the decision makers in deciding whether a venture capital investment should happen we as partners meet every monday 10 to 1 o'clock to decide on any deal that comes to us but before that it would have gone through my colleagues in a first or second meeting put they put together the data and actually you know pitch at the partners meeting so if you are a entrepreneur or if you are an incubator uh evaluating the progress of a fundraising process with your incubate you got to ask question have you had the first meeting second meeting has this your idea been discussed at their partner meeting have you got a term sheet and the term sheet is a very important thing which signals the sign that a venture capitalist is interested in doing a deal with you it is like a draft agreement right it is simple terms how much valuation how much capital what are the terms what can you use it for what are the rights what are the structure of the board 
these are simple things any term sheet on the website if you see you will you will come across some of these terms but that's if you don't get a term sheet and the first meeting is going on to the fifth meeting that means there is a problem so don't waste your time with that such a vc some cases it might actually become successful but if it doesn't follow this path you should be fairly concluding that maybe your idea is not unique, unique enough not big enough or your team is not good enough for uh, you to be seen as a market leader for that vc to consider you move on to the next vc and usually we found that for a million dollar 2 million dollar size in india this is anyway between 3 to 6 months for money to hit your bank uh, to get to that because you know they'll have to go through all this diligence you know uh, auditors will come in they'll scrutinize your numbers your documents you know all of that is a quick process earlier the company less of it but later the company 5 years 6 years that means your 5 years of accounting data people would want to look at it so it takes a little bit longer but earlier the company the quicker the checks checks will come okay so i think all these are fine but i want to stop here but happy to take any uh, closing questions from all of you does the group have any questions or vishal if you can facilitate that will be good uh if you have any questions you can uh, raise your hand so we can make you uh, panelist so we can ask directly with paul sir okay looks like i think um, everyone is good and fine so vishal uh, i don't have any other thoughts to share but i'll pause here uh, and vishal if you have any comments to make uh so once again uh, we can ask all participants if you have any questions you can share it in chat box or directly uh, give the option uh, raise hand so i can make you as panelist i think no questions are from uh, what is your advice to biotech startup regarding vc funds mm. a very broad question i don't know how to answer that i think all these principles that i mentioned applies to biotech also the good part that i'm uh, I'm, i'm understanding today is biotech startups um possibly have the ability to do that hockey stick curve that fast curve and that i think is i mean if you picked companies of that kind uh vcs would be really interested in you uh as an incubator serving biotech startups is more complex so if you're a medical device if, if you're a bio uh, sorry healthcare tech um, then you got to have hospital facilities access to hospital facilities to be able to do that at willgrow we partnered with the mazumdar shah medical foundation at nanana hridayalaya hospital to just to make sure that you have access to doctors and patients earlier on to do clinical trials tests and things like that uh the thing with biotech is the gestation period is so long and because the gestation period is long vcs not that vcs are worried about it but vcs are worried if the market size is not big and if they're taking risk in a long gestation period product then they want to really make sure that they become successful even after that they might actually fail but that's okay but you know on paper uh with gut and some data there should be sufficient evidence in a biotech in, in a startup with long gestation periods uh to be able to 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 have a large sized uh market which they can go and conquer once capital is available so the advice to a startup uh regarding vc funds would be if your gestation period is long 
please be very clear about convincing the vc with regard to market size that's very important also if the gestation period is long make sure that you are using the money for the right milestones because if you use it for the wrong milestones you know you wouldn't have shown enough proof points during that gestation period to attract more and more uh, vcs okay great uh i think uh, no more questions are there uh okay great thank so, you so we can mind up sir uh, um, so so thank you very much sir uh, for sharing uh, how to raise equity capital by startups and also touch every aspects that how and when the startup should uh, raise capital and uh, what are the things which vcs are looking uh, from startups and uh, apart from this like uh, this session has given a more clarity to incubation managers uh, to go back and work with the incubities uh, and uh, tell them uh, what are the things which a startup should focus when they are going to uh, raise the funds and uh, this was really a wonderful takeaway for uh, all the participants and i hope uh, everyone has used this opportunity so thank you once again sir uh, for sparing uh, your time for uh, with our incubation managers and uh, for participants we have we are also uh, organized uh, other two sessions uh, one one is basically a uh, session will be handled by startup india scheme startup india team so they will be talking about the schemes uh, uh, by startup india and the second session will be uh incubator administration in a global perspective by a program manager from intellect uh, dubai uh, group so hope you all will be available for the session and once again thank you sir uh, thank you very much sir thank you thank you everyone so sir uh, i think you will be sharing that ppt so uh, some people are asking that uh, yeah, yeah i'll do that ppt I'll, i'll share it with you okay sir thanks so sir thank you Bye. thank you very much sir Hello, sir. So, thank you, participants. Uh, i will be sharing the uh, slides to your email mail id thank you